receive our faith from a textbook. We received it from parents and teachers and non and priests, different people in our lives, our godparents. And we, when we look back at life lessons, there are things that perhaps, for example, mom or dad told us that uh, we heard a number of times over the years and it still comes up in our minds. And, and sometimes there's just like the one or two occasions when they said something in particular and we think, I, I, I don't I think I was in high school, but maybe I was in grade school, I can't remember. But if somebody said, what are the key things that your mother taught you? You'd have to kind of grab from a number of different places. That helps describe a little bit of the structure of the Gospel of Matthew. This year we've been reading the Gospel of Matthew. In five different segments you hear like stories about Jesus, and then what the scholars call a discourse. And that discourse, that homily, is from quotes that probably came from all three years of his public ministry, and they just kind of plucked it all right in that one chapter or four chapters. Then they go on to narrative, more stories, and then they stop. And there's this long homily with all kinds of words of advice, probably from all three years of his public ministry. So for example, the first batch of stories would be his birth, his baptism, and his first call of the disciples. And then his first discourse or homily, we call the Sermon on the Mount. And if you read that from chapter 5, 7, 8, you kind of like say, I, I can see where this probably wasn't just like one scattered thought kind of homily. All pearls of wisdom, and they put it all in there. And in that discourse, that first homily, he's preaching to the crowds. And then they start talking about stories until they get to the next extended discourse or homily or lesson. And just before that second one, you get this story from Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness. At the sight of the crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them, because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Well, the next discourse is only given to the twelve. And this would have been advice sprinkled over three years. Because these twelve, he's enrolling in the seminary. Now, I had seven years of instruction after high school, three at Franciscan University of Steubenville and four at Pontifical College Joseph Edom in Columbus, Ohio. And if you ask me that question that I propose to you, like, what did, when you think about what your mother taught you, what would stand out? If somebody said, Father, during your years after high school, when you weren't a priest yet, what stood out? Well, I'd probably say, like, for instance, I remember one time when I was at Steubenville, there was a holy hour, it was for men who were discerning the priesthood. And I remember a Franciscan priest saying, I haven't been a pastor my whole life, but when I was a pastor and I felt overwhelmed, I kept reminding myself from day one until that assignment was over, Jesus, you are the pastor. I am your assistant. Let me know what your will is. And that stuck with me. That jumped out at me. Well, then at the Josephina, they talk about liturgy of the hours. We have a visitor, Father Benedict Rochelle, who worked with broken priests. And he said he's not worked with a single priest who kept praying the liturgy of the hours. Morning prayer, day prayer, evening prayer, night prayer from the Psalms. And that so struck me that in my busiest days, you can catch me praying morning prayer at 6 p.m. I think, mean, by golly, I'm not going to be missing a 
you know, my prayer is I don't care if they're late. Because I'm aware of my brokenness, but I'm not going to be counted like one who lets the busyness of life allow prayer to slip. When Jesus is enrolling these disciples, two of the lessons that we heard today are these. To these seminarians, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of you. You can't live this life. If anybody comes before me, you're not going to be able to cut it. And then the other lesson, that when you go in ministry, whoever receives you, receives me, and receives the one who sent me, and the kindness that they offer you, you're never going to be really able to repair, but don't you worry, because I don't care if somebody so much as gives you a cup of cold water, I will reward them for their goodness to you. Now, people of God, of these lessons, how do they apply to you? We're talking about advice for seminarians, whether it was this one or the twelve. And it's important for us in Scripture to tease out little lessons for ourselves. So backing up, when I said that at Steubenville, I learned that when I'm pastor, I'm going to make sure that I'm actually the assistant and Jesus is the chief shepherd pastor of any parish that I serve. I say, Lord, they're your people, not mine. Just tell me what I need to do to help the others. Every one of us has families we come from. And I don't care if you're, let's say, a parent. And your kids are all in their 30s or 50s or whatever. To say, you know, Lord, I didn't just create them. You helped create them. And in baptism, I allowed you to be their father. So step it up. I can only do so much. They're your kids too. <laughs> or my aging parents, I feel overwhelmed. I don't know how much more I can do to help them. Hey, wait a second. My mom is your daughter. Do something for her. You know, sometimes we put way too much on our own shoulders and we have to say, let's let God be God. Like, I have to allow Jesus to be the pastor of the parish. Okay, next lesson. Liturgy of the Hours. The people who are most broken are the people who give up on prayer. That's kind of a simple thing. You don't have to pray Liturgy of the Hours like priests and nuns and deacons. Boy, you let a day go by without praying? Okay. But then the next day, yeah, you're going to be okay. Too many days. We're all broken people. And if we don't pray enough, that brokenness is going to overwhelm us and we're going to be in a heap of trouble. And then the gospel lessons. These 12 apostles who are seminarians as we hear them. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Flip it in a positive sense. He is saying that he, Jesus Christ, has to be the center of our lives. And if Jesus matters more to you than your spouse, which might be easy for a lot of you, I don't know. <laughs> and your spouse puts Jesus ahead of you, how is that going to harm your marriage? The closer you and every family member is to Jesus Christ, the closer you will be as a family. And then the last lesson about giving the cup of water to the prophet and receiving a reward. As I began, very few of us received our faith from a textbook. We don't need to give a cup of water to a textbook. We need to give a gift to the people who helped hand on the faith to us. And for some, it just means a hug. For some, it means a phone call, or visiting them in the nursing home, 
whether it's mom, dad, a nun, a priest, or whoever it might be, a coach. And for some, it means a prayer for the repose of their soul, maybe even a visit to a cemetery. And God, who sees this act of gratitude and kindness to the person who helped you receive the faith, will reward you. Little lessons. They seem to be for seminarians. But really, they do translate. 